Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, and welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Emily Best of Seed and Spark coming to us from Los Angeles. How's your day going, Emily? Very well, thanks. How are you? Very good. It's nice and sunny here in San Francisco. And um, yeah, we've got some fun events going on this week. So I'm pretty excited right now. Life is good. Great. Um, so thanks so much for joining. So first of all, let's just start out. What is Seed and Spark and why did you start this business? Sure. Um, Seed and Spark is a new kind of entertainment studio um, that combines the, the production and funding and distribution into a single platform the way that only the internet can enable. We've combined subscription streaming and crowdfunding into one holistic truly transparent independent studio model. So uh, creators come to us very early in the process and use the platform to crowdfund their projects and connect directly to audiences. Um, we help give them <clears throat> access to the tools that they need to build a direct connection with their audience that they can monetize. Our crowdfunding platform has the highest campaign success rate in the world by about two and a half times the next platform. And, uh, and then, uh, in the middle of last year, we launched a subscription streaming platform um, for two reasons. And one is to deliver the really excellent content directly to the audiences we had been growing on the crowdfunding side for many years. Um, and the other is to actually provide creators the transparency that they deserve around how their work is being watched. Cool. What were you doing before this? How'd you come up with this? Were you in, uh, are you a creative or are you a tech person? Or are you... Yeah, I had a very weird route to it, but um, what I was doing most recently before this was producing theater in New York, uh, the downtown version, um, the, the broken, starving artist version. Um, and in 2010, I produced a, uh, a site-specific run of a Nordic feminist play called Hedda Gabler, and only the theater nerds among your audience will know what that means. Um, uh, and I was working with this really incredible group of women. And it was something about working with this group of women. Our, our lead actress, Caitlin Fitzgerald, who's gone on to um, great success. She just wrapped up uh, four seasons on Masters of Sex. She's on Sweet Bitter right now. She did the most recent season of Unreal. She's like, like you know, a successful uh, TV and film actor. Um, but she was like just at the beginning of the rise of her career and she was getting auditions for all these big independent films. And the roles she was being asked to audition for were really insulting. Mm. And it was the first time I sort of got a critical look at how women were being represented on the big screen. And I realized like I wasn't there and my friends weren't there, my friendships weren't there. Uh, and I had never in my life considered going into the movie business. But with this group of women that I made this play with, we decided to make a movie specifically because we wanted to see friendships that we recognized on screen. Um, and it was the challenges and opportunities of making that movie that helped me understand what the challenges are in funding um, and in distribution if you're trying to tell a newer, different kind of story. Interesting, and, and I guess, okay, so that makes sense. Um, and I guess what your, you know, this idea came about, like you felt the Kickstarter, the Patreon, like the need wasn't being addressed by the, the various things out there. Um, so Patreon didn't exist yet. Um, Patreon and Seed and Spark have been on like pretty similar trajectories. Like I remember meeting with Jack at a coffee shop in Sebastopol like five or six years ago. And he was like, I'm starting this thing. And I was like, I'm starting this thing. We're like, cool, let's like know each other. Um, because we're both very much about sort of giving rise to a creative middle class. So I think there's a lot of synergy there. Um, when we wanted to raise money in 2011 for this movie, 
um, it didn't feel right to us to just ask for like a pile of money and um, and then go off to Maine for the summer where we were going to shoot because that's where we knew people and had resources. Um, we wanted people to really understand what it would take to make the film because this wasn't us just trying to make a movie. This was us trying to do something for society and our, our sort of avenue was film. Um, and so instead of, you know, a crowdfunding campaign, we built a, basically a wedding registry into our own little WordPress site. And we listed all the items we needed, right? The camera and the lighting and the coffee, which is really important, and the food and the makeup and um, bug spray and sunscreen, because we were gonna be in Maine for the summer. Um, and we sent this list to everyone we knew. And how long ago was this? It was long enough ago that we used the Facebook note function uh, and so I'm aging myself for I don't some remember time. it, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> for sure. Um, you didn't used to be able to just post a status of any length on Facebook. Um, but we sent it out to everybody we knew, and we needed to raise 20000 in cash in order to close our budget gap. We raised 23000 and then hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans and gifts of locations and goods and services. And so... When, I, when this would eventually turn into Seed and Spark, Seed and Spark's difference was you could build this wish list and people could see exactly what their money was going to support. Um, and that continues to be true. The way that you build your budget on Seed and Spark, you know, so your final sort of raise amount is through building your wish list. Interesting, cool. Um, it's fascinating to me. So I, I worked with, uh, Harry Chen, like way back when they were just starting out Kickstarter and, um, and it was even a different name back then called Critical Mass. And then, you know, but the original idea was he's just a fanatical guy about helping like artists. And, you know, some of the original ideas were helping bring, um, I think like a, some sort of um, electronica band to New Orleans or something like that. Right. Just, it was all arts focused and it's, you know, interesting to yeah. see how that's shifted over time and changed and all these, you know, crazy coolers uh, getting funded on there. But like the original vision was actually fairly similar to kind of what you're describing here, which is really interesting. It was true for Indiegogo as well. And I think, um, look, I think some of it has to do with just initial focus and some of it has to do with like, if you take like, and Kickstarter is a little different because they're a B Corp, but like if you take a ton of venture money, you have to go where the money is first and foremost. And our intention was, um, was actually never to be a, just a funding platform. Our intention was to build a new transparent kind of studio. And we knew when we started that distribution was like at the beginning of this like wave of shifting and that we would have to sort of shift with it. Um, because when we launched, Netflix had only just switched to the subscription online model. And like that behavior was not obvious to everyone. Yeah. Um, and it was actually very, was much more difficult to deliver then than it is now. Um, so we always work within our limitations and always work to st serve the needs of the creator. Um, but ultimately, like serving the needs of the creator is serving the needs of the audience. And our goal was always about increasing diversity and inclusion in entertainment. That was from, from day one, that was what we were, you know, out to do. And part of the reason that crowdfunding even works in entertainment is because filmmakers are making sort of a much bigger, there's a much bigger why. This isn't like me and my friends want to make a movie. It's like representation of this kind of story or these kind of characters has been utterly lacking for the last 120 years. And we now all, I think, more or less agree that as you can imagine, so you shall become. So who's on screen really matters. Mm. Um, and that's why, um, that, that was re really always our focus. Now, the, the inclusion problem in entertainment is ultimately a data problem. And that's really the broken part of the business. And so crowdfunding was the creator's first workaround to get a direct access to their audience. Mm -hmm. And like, yes, YouTube is a great place to go and build an audience, but like Google can change their terms of service. And all of a sudden the thing that you were monetizing is not monetizable anymore. Um, 
and this can happen a lot, right? It happened, we've seen it happen on Amazon Video Direct, and we've seen it happen on YouTube that they just changed their terms of service, and all of a sudden the creators are cut off from like a major supply of, uh, of their funding, and it's because they don't have in, like disintermediated access. And we always imagined ourselves as the thinnest possible line between a creator and their audience. Um, but that would also help aggregate, because audiences don't want to go to 100 websites yep. to, to visit all of their favorite movies or shows that would also aggregate audiences in a way that was valuable for both creators and audiences. So, okay, so we could go down many rabbit holes with all this, so, but I want to keep focused on um, or, or get yeah. into raising That's what capital. We're here to talk about. Right. What's that? We're here to talk about the funding. We're talking about funding. This is, we, I could spend an hour talking about other things, but let's get into raising money for Seed and Spark. So, um, so first of all, how much have you raised and how many rounds? Give us the kind of big picture uh, funding summary. So according to Carta, it's 4.3 million in total. Um, my first funding round was, all right, I'm here to tell the real story, right? So yep. here's, how, here's how it really went. Yes. I raised like $265,000 from uh, May to December of 2012. This was like the sort of quote unquote friends and family round, except I didn't have friends and family who wrote checks that size. So I, it, these were really like friends of friends of friends and their friends and family. Um, and, uh, it was really from, um, folks that were interested in, um, in the, like the impact of film. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I did that by, um, it was interesting. I didn't know then that this was a good practice. I was just doing it. And then in, in retrospect, I was like, oh, that was a good idea. Um, and I think people have talked about this all the time. There was a group of sort of advisor folks, because I was like, I think I'm going to start this business, I guess. I got to figure out who's going to help me do this. And I, there was sort of a circle of people that I was just constantly updating on how it was going and then checking in with them every month or two to like show them stuff and see what they thought. And, and it was like three or four of those people that turned into some of the first checks from between 10,000 and 125,000. It was like a wide range and like was, I was not uh, anyone to turn anything down at that point. And I took $5,000 checks, I took $125,000 checks. So the first sort of technical money in was that 265 and that closed the beginning of December of 2012. And that let me pay a outsourced development company to help me get the first version of the site off the ground. They built me a total lemon. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it was the worst experience, like of all the outsourced development experiences. Let me just, let me, I think I have, I think I have the Trump card on this one. Um, 10 concurrent users would crash the site. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty uh, bad. <laughs> And I was so lucky to have gone to high school with a bunch of flipping geniuses. And my friend Jason had, uh, um, had like basically left, I think left his job at Facebook or had just left his job at Facebook and agreed to help sort of salvage the site, um, which he did meticulously over the next um, many months. And um, during that time I continued to raise money, but like over the next 18 months, I would raise a total of a million dollars, um, which w would be my first sort of like announced funding goal or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and was that continuing? And, to, was that just continuing to tap friends and friends, friends and family, and friends of friends of family, or was it more? No, I was going after investors. Okay. Um, like almost nobody in that round were people I had known prior. Um, so look, I got very lucky and I took advantage of a certain kind of tokenism that was happening at that time in the film business, which is more or less as soon as we announced that Seed and Spark was a thing, I all of a sudden became like a young female CEO that 
film festivals and stuff could put on their panels and be like, see, we tried on the diversity thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, if you can't see my face or you haven't like seen a picture of me, I'm just like a white girl. So like if I'm your diversity, you are not trying. And it worked tremendously to my advantage in the beginning um, because I was being put on panels as if I were somebody, but like we hadn't proven ourselves really yet. Um, and, uh, and so I was at festivals and I was really doing the rounds and I was really trying to meet people. And that was kind of how I, um, I don't know if other industries have like such an advantageous place to go build a business, like the film industry has at film festivals because mm -hmm. there's always an industry sort of layer at film festivals and I was able to get in there and meet people and um and socialize things the other thing is like I think I was offering something that wasn't being offered much which was some real talk to filmmakers about what the world was in the age of the internet for them mm -hmm. people were people still are trying to drag the film business back into the 90s and it just like it's never going back there um but and those people it was good for a very certain set of people in the 90s and those are the people that were trying to drag it back there the rest of us are like trying to push it forward um uh but i think there is like there's still a lot of like what's getting educated in film schools is still a little bit archaic around what it is to actually be in the film business as an independent filmmaker now. So I was offering something I think that was a little different in perspective and that felt like fresh. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and so in 2014, we closed that round and um, what I found, it was really important to me to get women on my cap table. I didn't know then like what the stats were and I didn't know how lucky I was. Um, what I found was women angel investors all know each other, <laughs> um, like sort of nationwide. They're like, well, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Do you know this person? So it was really like finding that first core person to like unlock the next set. And it is true that um, it, is, it is the first check that's usually hardest to get. Um, and, uh, and that was sort of how that second, that like total 1 million came together. So, and so then in 20, go into a little more on that because the first 265 friends and friends and family, second one of a million was, was it all women angels or was it more, you know, like what was the actual kind of makeup of that? And how did you identify that first, uh, woman angel that sort of got you into the, the network? Yeah, so the, I would say the person who like really, so the first woman angel who came in who I didn't know who was in the film space is a woman named Lisa Kleiner Chanoff who um, runs Catapult Film Fund and she actually came in as part of that 265 on a reference from somebody else who had invested in that round. I met her, she was interested in me, she made a very small investment. Um, but that was, she's extraordinarily well regarded in the film space and particularly the film impact space, makes beautiful movies, enables tons of filmmakers. Um, and um, through my sort of like speaking circuit, I went and taught a workshop at um, an event for uh, an organization in San Francisco called Chicken and Egg Pictures. And Chicken and Egg Pictures is, um, co-helmed by this amazing group of women and Julie Parker Bonello is one of the co-founders. Um, and I taught this workshop and afterwards she was like, I want to talk to you. I'm interested in you. And we talked several times and Julie decided to invest. And then Julie like really opened up. She's on my board now. Um, she really opened up her network. Um, and because she has been investing in the film impact space for so long, those were the other people that she was really connected to. And I think like it was probably six other investors and five of those six were all were women. And, but they had come from the film space, not so much the tech startup space. Is that right? I mean, it's, it, when it, it's yeah. kind of interesting. Because... No, that first million was not tech startup money. Mm -hmm. That first million was primarily the like film impact space money. Um, I had in 2012 met with a bunch of VCs. Oh, so there's a part of the story I totally, I, I forget about, which is I, I decided to enter, like on a whim, I saw this thing on the internet and I decided to enter, there was a channel back then uh, called Beta Beat. It was like a, mm. you know, a, 
it was part of the New York Observer, right? And um, they decided to do this like filmed pitch competition, like pre-Shark Tank, uh, this filmed pitch competition. And it was Steve Schlafman and Nikhil Kalgadi. Um, I don't remember what firms, Schlafman was with like Lair at that time. And I don't remember, Nikhil was maybe with SoftBank. I can't, I can't remember. Anyway, I decided to enter this pitch competition and I practiced a bunch and a, a, a guy who had been sort of advising like really ran me through um, and I entered and I won, <laughs> um, like much to my total shock and surprise. I won this pitch competition. And that actually allowed me to meet with like a couple of VC firms. And I very quickly learned like I was not, that was not going to go well for me. One, because like I didn't, I had no idea what they were looking for, right? I didn't understand the language, did not speak the language at all. Um, so that was one piece of it. Uh, the second was there was, I'm not going to name names here, but like there was a very successful founder who had started a coupon company uh, who decided to move into the film space and took money from basically like every fund that would even entertain content whatsoever. And so because he had like a big name behind him mm -hmm. and he started a company um, that was sort of a long tail distribution idea for festival films. And I could see all the reasons why it wasn't going to work partially because it sort of relied on the dashed hopes of filmmakers at festivals, which is not a great time to meet them. Um, and so I was going around and everybody I met with had invested in this company and this company like sort of made a big splash and then immediately folded. Like it just wasn't producing the returns that I think a like Silicon Valley success was interested in. And so he just like shuttered it and moved on. Um, and so they were all like, well, if he can't be successful at it, why can you? And I, I heard that 10, 15 times. Um, right. And I started to realize that like I needed people who'd been living and breathing in the film space and really understood what its challenges were and cared about those challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so very quickly I was like, okay, well, VC is not for me. Um, and I was, I mean, I really didn't speak the language and it took me like five or six meetings to realize I, I didn't belong here. Like I, this was, it was so clear to me so quickly in every one of these rooms, every one of these phone calls I took, like I didn't belong here. Um, and so I really turned my attention away from that because it, it just felt like spinning my wheels. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating to me because it's, you're sort of right at this intersection of like film world and startup world, right? And like, I've been around the startup fundraising world forever. But like, if you ask me how to raise money for a film or any media project, I would have absolutely no clue of how to do it, where to start. Just like you're saying, I wouldn't know the language to speak. I wouldn't know what moves people. Like it's, you know, these things are all learnable, but they're kind of, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting because you're just walking these two, walking the fine line between these two little worlds. So, and you're kind of crossing between them to both too. Um, they, could, they could learn a lot from one another, right? Um, I feel like, VC would do well to listen more closely to like honesty, authenticity, the truth, the heart of it. Um, and film would do well to like learn the data and the traction piece mm, um, uh, a little better and to make a better business case. So I think there's, I think that's been the cool part of sitting between them. And I think, um, Look, in a, in a film pitch, when you sit down across from someone, you've done your research to figure out what part of this pitch is likely to hook that person personally. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and I actually think I'm only interested in the investors who can be hooked personally, mm -hmm. right? Like somebody investing with only their wallet would make me, would, would pressure me to make decisions unrelated to sort of the fundamental core values or core um, ethos of the business. But somebody who's hooked personally will understand some of the, the less 
There are some, some like non-data driven pieces of what makes a business successful around trust and reputation and ethos and values. And yep. if those aren't also part of the conversation. So if I go into an investment meeting and I realize I can't hook someone emotionally or personally at all, like it isn't a fit for me. So that's where I feel like the two can talk to each other. No, that's good. I like that. Um, okay. So let's keep moving. I want to kind of loosely put a chronology around this somewhere along the line you got into tech stars so get us to that point here just just before tech stars um so 2014 i closed the angel around i did a five hundred thousand dollar bridge in 2015 um and then in 2016 uh i got a term sheet from my Dream VC. Uh, is that right, or was it the first bridge? Was the no? It was the second bridge. Um, I got a I got a I got a term sheet from my Dream VC with terms that were so insulting. My lawyer said, and I quote, and I apologize for your audience. I know what you're going to say. This is not a term yeah, uh, go. Yeah, this is not a term sheet. <laughs> No, to this is a term sheet you say go fuck yourself uh -huh. and he is you guys he's a really really nice person um i'd never heard him speak like that and uh so we walked away from this term sheet for like a million and a half dollars uh and launched a um uh, a crowdfunding uh campaign like an equity crowdfunding campaign on crowdfunder weeks later because we're like, well, <laughs> here's the thing we know how to do. Um, and it was really successful for us and it allowed us to get enough money in the bank um, to you know, stay alive. And um, that's, no, I'm getting this wrong. That was the 2015 bridge. In 2016, we raised a little bit more um, because we wanted to uh, make some enhancements to the site. Uh, without like too much sort of milestone stuff packed around it. And then um, in the fall of 2016, there was a big strategic investor who came into my office and met everyone and was talking about uh, like leading at least a million on a 10 million valuation and um, that was the information that I had when I interviewed at Techstars. Um, we went to Techstars Boston, and I thought my job there was just to like close the rest of that round, did a bunch of diligence with them, and then they went totally silent. Mm. Like, totally and completely silent. Um, and that was really terrible and scary because I had um, sort of put a timeline together around that. Um, and now I'm in Techstars, which for anybody who's done an accelerator program, you know how demanding the program itself is. So trying to sort of do program, run your business and fundraise all at one time is, um, is a lot to ask. And we had some big initiatives launching and the team was split up because like I didn't take all 10 people to Boston um, from LA. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, and then I would spend the next 18 months trying to raise well, I guess two years in total trying to raise um, like a $2 million seed round, which is how we came to meet each other. Yeah. And yeah. And I'm going to link your article, which is a great article in the, in the footnotes of the, the, the podcast. Um, okay. Let's touch on a couple of these. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit, but this, this two, 2000s, this term sheet that you told them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> Why were they your dream investor? And what were the terms that were so bad? And was there zero negotiation? Did you, I guess maybe, did you not have any negotiating leverage or they just would not negotiate with you, right? If it's your dream investor, was there a way to make it work? Let's kind of poke at a few of these things. You bet. Um, in 2012, before I even launched Seed and Spark, I went to an event by a organization that I think then was called Crowdflower and it was like a whole crowdsourcing super event and I saw this investor speak and I was like man I really admire him and his ethos and kind of what he stands for and I've heard great things about him from friends um 
And I, I remember thinking to myself, like, someday I want him to invest in my company. And I got his card back then, and I, like, sort of um, I pinged him maybe one or two times. But um, when we were starting to, like, raise a serious round, uh, that was sort of the first intro that I was really interested in. And my friend Ryan made the intro, and I went and met with him in New York. And at that meeting, he brought in one of his LPs, who is a like in the film space, an investor in film, has his own sort of like film company to evaluate it because he's like, look, I'm not a film expert. I want to make sure that like as we do diligence, we have somebody who knows the film business. Um, and then they put us through eight months of diligence. And hmm. if I knew then what I know now, I would have told them to go fuck themselves at month two. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, but uh, I didn't, and I was so hopeful because they were my dream investor, and I, and like people said such nice things about them as a fund, and um, uh, yeah. But this LP like kept asking for new business models and new this and new that, and and um, to meet these people, and then um, I'm trying to remember the exact sequence of events. Uh, they told us finally in August of 2015 that they were going to send us a term sheet. And I wept, I wept in a ball on the floor. It was an amazing moment. I was so excited. Uh, we threw a party for, we were publishing a magazine then called Bright Ideas and we had a launch party for Bright Ideas and this LP and his friend came and he got like a little drunk and he um he mentioned that he was like oh yeah and we'll just we'll just do your series a like i just made these contacts at alibaba and we'll just like flip you to alibaba in like 12 months hmm. and i remember being like i don't want to do that so i was like we can talk about this like at another time outside of the party that's not really the direction i'm interested in going um but, and I don't think that was something he might have said that way had he not been a few drinks deep. Mm. Uh, and then I got the term sheet. And the term sheet was for $1.5 on a $3.5 million post money. Mm. And they wanted two board seats. Wow. Uh, and, and they wanted all my equity for me. And they wanted me to earn it all back. And I was like, oh, you're just going to, you're trying to buy and transact my company. That's what's happening here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I went to my lawyer to like, because I read it and I was like, this doesn't look good. And I went to my lawyer and I was like, can you please walk me through like deal point for deal point? What are they actually asking? Because I couldn't, I like couldn't believe my eyes, really. Mm -hmm. um, and that was when he said, this is a term sheet. You don't say no to you, say go fuck. He's like, this doesn't, this is not a term sheet that indicates there is any interesting negotiation because like it's there's there it's so bad that even a negotiated version of this is not good yeah. and i'll be honest like what you're supposed to do is take that term sheet and like circulate it to other funds to like get them interested in you i was too embarrassed to show this to anyone else that's interesting. like i couldn't even use it for that um and it's funny it makes me feel emotional a little bit like it was a really humiliating like a profoundly humiliating experience. So then um, I get that term sheet. I like push back and I'm like, would you be willing to do like these three things, like trying to swallow this hard pill, but starting to feel like maybe I don't want to be in business with these people in the first place, especially the LP. And then I get, and I, then I get a text message. So it's clear that what's happened is I sent this to the funds and the fund contacted the LP with like the negotiating deal points. And I get this creepy text message from the LP that says, um, life is about the choices we make. Don't think about now, but what can and could be. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> is this a fortune cookie or a, uh, uh, yeah. And I was like, we're done. Uh huh. Um, so I wrote to my current investors who I'd been like keeping up to speed on all of this investors and advisors, like, here's the state of things. Here's the experience that I just had. I'm going to walk away from this term sheet and we're going to do an equity crowdfunding campaign instead, because I think this is a terrible deal. 
right? Because mm-hmm. I had to, I owed my investors an explanation for like, why am I walking away from $1.5 million? Yeah. Somebody, somebody on that uh, email, and I'm pretty sure I know who it was, forwarded, forwarded it back to the fund. And I got an angry phone call from my dream investor about why was I telling people that they were backing out of the deal? And I was like, first of all, reread the email, the confidential email that you were forwarded. Um, and let me know if that's what it says. And second of all, let me recount for you the experience I just had. And that is the experience that I reported to my investors. And if you have a problem with what my experience was, then you should think about how you behaved. But I'm not going to apologize for anything that I did. Um, and he he, he backed off. I then got another angry email from the other partner in the fund. And I said the same thing to him. And he also backed off, but I was like, Oh, here's what it looks like when the good old boys club circles up because now they were worried that their like shiny little reputation was tarnished because Mm -hmm. they weren't paying attention to how their LP was behaving or how I was getting treated. And the good old boys wagon circled and tried to make me feel like tried to shame me into a corner and I was not fucking having it. (laughs) So like that was the point at which I was like, fuck VC, like almost entirely. If, if ones that are like as well spoken about as that can behave this way, like I don't, I'm not, I'm not interested in their money. And of course, then I would go to tech stars and like get sort of reindoctrinated around like, I need the blue chip VC. And then I would have to go through another process of realizing I didn't want to like be in that environment. And like, I am not at all saying that all VC is bad. I'm not. I think there, I know so many great people who work in VC and there is a particular like business that it, they require VC and VC requires them. I don't happen to be that kind of business yet. Maybe we will be someday, in which case, you know, I, I have lots of relationships I would like to stoke up. But that was, a, that was the first time I, I really, like, got a taste for what that environment could be like. Um, and, you know, that wasn't for me. Yeah. So, um, so part of the reason I, you know, and I had turned down opportunities to apply for Techstars um, before then. Um, and uh, it seemed like it was sort of time for me to go and get a little bit more structure and kind of network around me because I, I just felt like I clearly wasn't meeting all of the right people. Um, and so that's part of what um, I went to Techstars to, to do. Okay, let's go into that a little bit. So you went in there with this strategic investor, a different, not your dream investor, but- oh, yeah, a, a new strategic investor. And then they ghosted. Yeah. And did you ever hear back from them? Like, did you ever figure out? Because I think this is always interesting to kind of unpack, like, either why a deal didn't happen or why someone ghosted you. Did you ever figure any of that out? Or is it a mystery to this day? (laughs) To this day, a mystery. Um, And I will say, you know, I, I posted the article about this experience. and I can't believe how many people have had similar experiences. I also saw that my article got tweeted by an investor who ghosted me oh, being like none of this grit and perseverance surprises me and I wanted to tweet him back and be like really dude <laughs> like, that's funny uh, that's funny uh-huh. yeah so it's, it is an alarmingly common practice and I actually found myself recently um calling someone out about it I was I had done like a lot of diligence work for a fund and then they just went dark for like two months and I finally wrote them back and I was like, I don't think this is what you mean to be about, but let me tell you what my experience of this is. And, you know, for as founder friendly as you say you want to be, this is, this is really terrible for me. Um, and they, they wrote back apologetic and whatever, but it was like, I I do feel like it's, um, it's a behavior that people start to let happen because they get busy and given how much, this is an important part of the process. Like, I don't think that is something that, that people can allow be part of their kind of MO. Um, but this was like a big, like TV corporation. So I guess I should be not surprised at all. Like maybe that person moved jobs and just dropped the ball. I don't know. Um, I'll never know. You know, I think you have to, I, you know, my unsolicited two cents is that you have to almost treat it analytically and algorithmically like my rule of thumb is if i've emailed an investor 
two or three times without a response, I simply mark them as yep. no response, which is, and, and yep. I think no response is the same as a no. So I'm just moving them in my own column in my CRM as a no. It's just a different type of no, right? So, and that way you, you don't have this emotional like, oh, why aren't they responding? Why aren't they, you know, why are they ignoring me? It's just a, a, a function. If they haven't done it two or three times, do it gets moved to no. And it's, takes away a little of that like self wonderment, <laughs> you know? Um, I, think, I think the challenge is how, how deep in the process are you yeah. when the ghosting happens, right? It's like, it's like, if it's somebody that I had one meeting with and then they just sort of never get back to me, I'm like, all right, they're clearly not interested. If it's somebody that I've done months of diligence with and then they go dark, like that, that one is, I think a little harder to understand. I agree with you, it is still a no, that it's harder to like pinpoint why. Yeah. Right. right. No, that makes sense. Okay. I want to um, let's keep an eye on the clock and I have two more questions I want to kind of touch on. Just connect the dots between tech stars and then ending up with uh, Backstage Capital, which is a fascinating firm yeah. on its own. Maybe connect the, the journey there for a minute. And then, you know, just the kind of big overarching question is, now that you know from the last what is it uh six seven years of this what would you do differently if you would start over again would you just <laughs> avoid these things all together and try and stick well, with maybe that's too big a question but um those are my final two questions for you it's funny i haven't thought about it sort of thinking back from the beginning well so i went to Techstars 16 weeks pregnant um and over the three months of the program got you know increasingly pregnant and I was, you know, fundraising for a content business in Boston, which is a stupid place to talk to anybody about a content business. And Boston knows that I'm not, <laughs> not um, like insulting them in any way that they wouldn't insult themselves. Uh, yeah, I, I think Techstars did a really good job of talking about how to take meetings, how to advance meetings. Um, and I think at least for me, I didn't find the guidance that I needed in um, who to actually meet with. There still was this sort of primacy on the blue chip VC. Um, and I figured, because I was at Techstars, like those are meetings that I should start to take, you know? And I will say it was really good training, but um, once I got out of the program and having, you know, pitched everybody even remotely appropriate in Boston and, and getting a whole lot of no's, um, I came back to California and met a lot of mostly LA, but a few San Francisco firms that um, were through Techstars Connections, maybe 20 of them. Um, and, you know, it was a very difficult time around our business model for a couple of reasons. And one was we had gone to Techstars to pivot the business. Um, we were a crowdfunding platform with a, with a um, external distribution component. So um, we had transactional VOD on the platform, but we could distribute the films from our platform into 100 million U.S. homes across all of these you know, cable, VOD, and iTunes, and Amazon, and Google Play, etc. cetera. Um, we decided in 2015 that that's a terrible business model because it totally cuts off the filmmakers from the essential data that they need to like make smart and efficient marketing distribution decisions. Um, uh, we went to Techstars to basically formulate a new plan where we would become what we are now, this like end-to-end -end studio that includes subscription streaming. Um, so we were like a series A investment vis-a-vis -vis the crowdfunding platform, but like a pre-seed investment vis-a-vis -vis the streaming. And for anybody to make an investment, they would just have to make a bet that what we were able to do on the crowdfunding, we'd be able to do in the streaming. Um, and so at that time, it probably was not a great pitch for a lot of these VCs who like are traction, 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 especially, let's be honest, if you're not a white dude. Like the traction that uh, women and people of color are asked for is head and shoulders above and beyond mm. anything that their white male counterparts are ever asked for because there's a lot more faith in their ability to execute naturally um, and sort of the big vision that they, they pitch. Um, we, uh, we managed to round up a group of angel investors who wanted to lead the, this like series seed in the fall of 2016. 
Um, and then the, like, I actually got the term sheet together six weeks after I gave birth to my son. Um, so I, I was still Amazing. technically supposed to be on maternity leave. Uh -huh. I came back to work um, to try to circle up the, the remaining money. And then the election happened um, a few weeks later. And that was really where we felt like the operating landscape of our business profoundly changed because so on the positive side, there was a real motivation for people to vote with their dollars for their mm -hmm. values. Um, and on the negative side, it all, it all of a sudden felt like we really had to protect the notion of diversity and inclusion and like solidify that into the very fabric of the business. And so, um, as I said in the article, like the pitch became a little bit shakier in the coming months because we were just sort of like morphing around how are we gonna like do these things and what was our messaging gonna be coming out of this. In January of 2017, we launched 100 Days of Diversity in partnership with 40 other film organizations to make sure that filmmakers were making their work now. Mm. Um, and that was an incredibly successful endeavor um, where we started to learn what it would mean to our business when we really like leaned into diversity and inclusion like in every place and it started to affect our um, our streaming and all of, our, all of our streaming programming and um, it was just like a shaky time to be pitching the business um, but we were in like real dire financial straits um, and I pitched Arlen in December uh, finally like no oh. December it must be January because I pinged her like right after the election and this was around the time when we really wanted to do something around diversity and inclusion that was just like, I have this idea. I'd love to talk to you about it. And she's like, I'm going to need a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> like many of us, it really hard. Uh -huh. um, we ended up talking in January and it was just, um, she was like, I've been trying to invest in your company for like months. That was the meeting. I was like, yeah. great. This is going great. Um, uh, and um, she came in and, and it was actually an amount of money that like, rescued us that month um and gave us gave me i think personally a little wind under my sails but it also got me really thinking about um if we're going to be focused on diversity and inclusion then who we're enriching mm. really matters if we're to be successful so the cap table needs to reflect the people that we're uh trying to serve yeah and you mentioned that, or I read that. I thought that was interesting, kind of your thinking about your cap table matching the people you serve, like you just said, which is yeah. pretty interesting. I don't think too many people kind of think about it like that. So that's, that's interesting. So well, did ultimately, I think the, the thing that I came to was um, I don't want dispassionate numbers only people involved because we are not dispassionate numbers only uh, we're like entrepreneurs at yeah. Seed and Spark. Like we, we are doing this inside the like capitalist framework that we're given where we know in order to affect the change that we want to affect, we have to build a massively successful company, right? And we're doing that because like these are the rules that are written right now. I think, um, you know, a lot of the members of my team are really involved in sort of post-capitalism and what comes next in ways that we can better serve everyone's values that aren't necessarily related to economic value and very interested in the future of work and the mm -hmm. role that technology will play. But ultimately, like inside the framework that we currently live in, which is this sort of like, you know, very returns fueled uh, environment, we need, we're a long game, we're a long play. Um, sure. And so people who are investing in VCs are buying returns. Mm -hmm. That's what they're buying. They're buying returns like on a timeline and um, they're buying financial returns. And so we realized quickly that we needed to be working with people who were interested in, um, in financial returns that also had a positive effect on the world. And that, just changed who I was talking to. I think for years I had been trying to say, like I had been trying to separate the values of the business from the core business itself, because I know that this thing can be right. really economically viable, but like, I don't 
give a shit about it if it doesn't have the values on top of it. I don't think it's important. I won't wake up every day and do it. And so if there aren't people sort of like on board for that part with me, then they're not the right people for me. And it's not on a, like we have to be able to make some values driven decisions ahead of growth. And that like, I had to establish that up front in my meetings yeah. to say, look, if you're interested in like us flipping this company in 18 to 24 months, it's probably not going to happen. So let's talk realistically about like what we think the timelines are and what we really want to do here. And I started going in interviewing the investors mm -hmm. as opposed to the other way around. And that like changed the game for me is I was going in and saying, this is what I want to do. Are you interested in supporting this effort? And then answering all of their like very right questions to ask about, mm -hmm. you know, market size and financial viability and customer acquisition and all of those things. But like really the conversation had to start with, let me lay some groundwork for you. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to do it. Is this something that you want to do with me? Great. Now let's get to the like technical questions. That's interesting. Yeah. No, I like that. I've heard this from others that I've done on this podcast of like really flipping it around and interviewing the investors, you know, versus the other way around. Instead of being interrogated, you're kind of doing the interviewing. I think that's a good approach. Okay. Just to wrap this up, what are the top, because you've had a really interesting story and I want people to read it, look for the link in the footnotes. Um, but, you know, what two or three things, you've had a lot of like heartache and grief and some, you know, some pretty exciting moments too, but what two or three things would you, would you do differently if you were doing this all over again? Kind of your, your advice to your younger self, anything jump out? Yeah, I would spend more time articulating for myself. I mean, it's a, if I knew then what I know now, right? Like I didn't know enough about what it is to grow a business to know these things, but I would try to say, look, I would probably have researched, maybe interviewed a bunch more CEOs who had built the kinds of companies that I wanted Seed and Spark to become and asked them what that growth looked like and how they spoke to their investors um, to try to understand how do you like partner with the people that you really want to partner with? I wish I had known in advance that this was more about me finding the, my people than me begging for cash or like me asking for people to like me enough or take a risk on me. Um, mm -hmm. yep. I really would have gone into it looking for partners, not investors. Um, yep. Okay. And uh, I didn't really know know how and I still don't know that I, I did a good job um, ever of really making fundraising my full-time job mm. and especially for sole founders or, or people who have sort of one fundraiser who also has other jobs it's a very very difficult balance and I think it's really unfair for people to be like you got to be full-time fundraising um, especially in the early stages when like you're also full-time everything else um, but it's really finding a way to concentrate and focus all your efforts. Um, at the very beginning, like I use a, just like a sales management tool to manage my pipeline of investors and see where they are and kind of how likely I think their investment is. And, um, just, just putting a visual, I'm a very visual person. So putting a, like a visual pipeline together, um, was hugely helpful for me to understand like where the pipeline was weak and where I had to fill it in. Because that can be hard to see in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. All right, so last question. Do you have any um, call to action, anything you want to plug? Um, if people want to learn more, it's just seedandspark.com, correct? Right, yep. Um, well, there are two things I think could be fun. One is if you're a fan of horror films, there's a crowdfunding rally going on right now. You could support any one of, I think, 33 amazing horror films. Um, that's on the site right now. And, um, you know, a $6.99 subscription to Seed and Spark gets you access to an absolutely beautifully, totally human, not algorithmically curated library of movies and shows you really won't find anywhere else. Um, and you can discover some pretty special artists there and know that your money is going right into their pockets when you watch their stuff. So um, I would highly recommend that as well. Awesome. 
Very good. Emily, we've covered a ton of stuff here. This is fun. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for sharing your, <laughs> your wild and woolly journey. And uh, everyone listening, check out Seed and Spark. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good have a good uh, rest of the journey. It sounds like an exciting time for you guys. So I want to hear, hear what's next. We'll catch you after the next uh, round or next milestone. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Bye.